Well, welcome everyone. I'm Julie Hansen, and I am delighted to introduce our guest today, uh, Jen Mueller, who is self-described as rarely at a loss for words. And I don't think she'll disappoint today. <laughs> uh, she pursued a career in sports broadcasting because she got numerous repeated comments from teachers and friends and family that she talked too much. So sounds like a perfect career. Uh, she is a 19 year sports broadcasting veteran. She currently serves as the Seattle Seahawks sideline radio reporter. And she's also part of the Seattle Mariners television broadcasting team on Root Sports. And in addition to her roles on the sideline, she also founded a company, uh, Talk Sporty to Me, where she provides online training in conversation and communication and leadership skills. Uh, Jen is also the author of three books and a popular keynote speaker I know who provides practical insights and fascinating stories from her life working in and around locker rooms. So Jen, welcome to the show. I'm so excited for our viewers to learn from your experience. Well, thank you. It's nice to have an audience who wants to listen to some of my stories because, you know, my <laughs> friends and family have heard them all before at this well, point. So I'm, I'm sure we've, we've worn them all out, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> well, you have a wealth of experience. And so I, let's just start at the beginning. So what was your first broadcasting job, the first time you were in front of a camera? And, and what was that like? So my first real job out of college and right before I graduated from college, I was a booker. So it was my job to book guests to come on a live sports show that was on a cable TV station in Dallas. Now, if I were to say that today, everybody knows what that looks like because we have a ton of shows that have followed that format. But back 20-ish years ago, people weren't doing what we would consider sports talk radio on TV. So I had to convince these people, and these were high profile people. Some of them were former Dallas Cowboy players or owners of teams and athletes that were currently in the market. I would convince them to come on the air. They would call in to the show or they would come in live to our studio and while that was my job, I really wanted to be on TV. That just happened to be the job that somebody offered me before I graduated from college. And I thought, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have a job in hand, right? So when we would get certain guests, I would make a pitch to create a, a story that we would air to introduce the guest who was coming on the show. And so I would go out and kind of enterprise my own stories. The most fun that I ever had with that is we brought a WWF wrestler onto the show once. And in order to provide some background, I went out to where they trained and they taught me how to do some moves. Really? And I thought that I was just the coolest thing doing a stand up, which is where you're on TV and you're talking, um, while pretending to body slam this guy. <laughs> I will tell you this, it took more than one take. I got terrible whiplash because those floors actually aren't padded. And now when I go back and I look at the tape, I'm like, that was the cheesiest, <laughs> dorkiest thing. But I thought it was just the greatest thing in the entire world. And so I think we all have those experiences of, man, we, we thought we were pretty good. And then you look back and go, oh, that needed some fine tuning. Right. Yeah. Room, room to grow, room to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the lessons that you learned about being on video and being in front of the camera? Certainly you've had a, lo a long career and, and had some opportunities to try different things. Some things work, yeah. some things don't. Uh, maybe some teachers along the way. What did that path look like for you? Well, you know, it was a lot of behind the scenes work first. So once you get into TV, you really don't want to exit and try to get back in. And once you get on the production side of TV, which is me behind the scenes, writing stories and scripts and stacking shows that ultimately would be for somebody else to read on camera, it's really hard to transition to being on camera. So I was trying to do both simultaneously. And looking back, it's really helpful because our shows are timed out to the second. You know, you don't have the option of going just a little bit over. There are certain things that you have to make sure that you hit within seconds. And when you were on the side that I was on, 
where it is up to you to execute, you have a new appreciation for what it takes and what you appreciate on the other side, right? The anchor and the reporter who can make your job easier as a producer. So I would be producing these shows and after everybody went home, I would put together my own stories and my own shows from like midnight to 2.30 in the morning. I would show it to my boss the next day, I'd get feedback. And this went on for a long time until I could convince somebody that, look, I do have the skills that it takes. Here's what I've been doing for all of these years. Would you give me a chance to be on camera? And what I learned is number one, because of that, you know, I was essentially like beg borrowing and stealing time from people. If I had a chance to be out with a photographer, I got one take. The, the photographer was not there for me. The photographer was there to do the actual job, right? To cover the press conference, to cover the actual reporter who was assigned to that job. So if my photographer was kind enough to shoot a stand up, I better get it on one take. And I tell you what, you learn an awful lot about being really good right out of the gates and not missing that opportunity. To this day, I still take a lot of pride in being able to do it in one take. And it's not because um, of anything other than we don't have time to waste. And my photographers who work with me now know that when I say it's only going to take 45 seconds to do this, it truly will only take 45 seconds to do this. So that was one of the early lessons of make sure that every time you're on camera, you are prepared and you expect that to be the only chance that you get. It does help when you think about now shooting videos for my own business or my own website, Yes, you can fix things in post, mm -hmm. but you really don't want to, right? You, you don't want that to be your, your default mode because it takes a lot of time. If you just concentrate at the beginning, you're going to have better results. And then you learn in those moments how to connect to the camera. We, we all do these things in school and, and you know this from your training, mm -hmm. you think it's really easy until suddenly there's people around and they're watching you and you are talking to essentially nobody and you are making it sound like it's the most exciting thing in the world and people are giving you weird looks and they're trying to walk behind the shot and and so you just learn to connect to the camera like it is a person in front of you and that takes time you know it takes doing it over and over again so i would say those were the two early lessons that i learned about being on camera that's great. I mean, you talk about two things that are really key there. I think that preparation, that, you know, doing it in one take, because uh, while, yes, when salespeople are recording videos to send to prospects or, or you know, social media, they have that luxury of, of re-recording and editing. But again, your job is to, you know, get volume out there and not spend a lot of time editing and finessing. And then also when you're on a live call, it is basically a one take, right? You're, yes. if you're live talking to a customer or interviewing somebody, you know, that's it. You're not, there's no going back. So you really do have to be prepared. So what does your preparation look like and how, how has that evolved as you've gotten more experienced? So I would say there is one thing that has always stayed the same. And that is I talk to myself a lot. I always have. I have from the time that I was a kid that was part of the talking too much thing. <laughs> but in this profession, I do spend a lot of time rehearsing not only the script that I think that I'm going to say. So for example, if I am driving into a Seahawks game and I know that I need to have a way to open the show, I will actually say out loud the words I think I'm going to use when we go on air. I will see how it sounds. I will see where I can uh, change a word and give it greater impact. I will figure out the emphasis. And then I will think through the rest of that conversation so that I play both sides of the conversation back in my head. And I think that this is really important. So. Number one, it is scripting. Everything that you see on TV is scripted. Yes, we ad lib some during a post game show because you just can't anticipate every single thing that's happening in a game. Right. But scripts really do help you stay on track. And once you get that script down, you have to consider how this plays to all different audiences. So think through if I said this without any other context, would the audience know what I'm talking about? 
Does the audience need more? Do they need less? Did I just spend way too much time, like 30 seconds, giving them no duh information when what they really wanted to hear from me was the whole purpose of why I'm on the air or why I shot the video within the first 15 seconds, right? If I was the listener, we're, we're always enamored. When, when the camera's on me and I've got the microphone, of course I think that everything that I have to say is brilliant. <laughs> but if I'm an audience member, how does that play? And so I spend a lot of time <clears throat> thinking through both sides of that conversation and saying the words out loud. So if I'm doing an interview with an athlete, I will ask the question, I will anticipate how they might respond. I will anticipate the positive and the negative, mm -hmm. right? So what happens if they shut me down? How do you recover on live TV, right? And turn that conversation back around. What happens if it's positive and they make me laugh? Where would I go from there? Um, those sorts of things. So that when it's actually time to be on camera, I'm not going in cold. I've already kind of warmed myself up, right? You, you, I've given myself the opening act. I've already got the energy right. level right. I've got the words right. And I am in control of what's happening and that's where you want to be when you're on video, right? This is your space and you need to own and control that because this is all the audience knows about you. Mm, right. They don't have all that, that uh, luxury of the, the context that you'd like them to read ahead right. of time. Right. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, you, you made some great points and I, and I think that uh, you and I both talked about scripting and being fans of scripting, not that things go according to script necessarily, but having played that out and being prepared gives you a certain level of confidence and you're able to wing it. I was, you know, I'm a big fan of improv and I, and improv is still about knowing your stuff, right? It's not just coming with a blank mind and, you know, stream of consciousness necessarily, there's actually rules to it. But I find also in sales, for example, you, if you script things out, if you think through what your questions are, they become more crisp and clear. Because like you said, if you've got a 30 second question that goes around the bend and there's three different parts to it, that's, you're not going to get the results you want. Well, and I think that that's a really important point to make when asking questions, because I think most people misunderstand what a conversational interview is. When people talk to me about moderating a panel or making sure that a converse or that an interview is very conversational, they think the best way to get to that outcome is just to wing it and to react off of what the other person says, right? Because they think they're going to be able to stay in the moment. And here's we're what all I'm professional say. improvisers, but, right? Right, right. And also, when you were in that position and you were the one leading the interview, particularly if this is a sales conversation, think about all the things that you were trying to do. Think about how you were trying to have your energy come through in a virtual medium now where you don't have the luxury of body language also getting part of your message across, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have the luxury of having your energy level dip because now it sounds like you aren't interested or aren't engaged in the conversation. So you have to maintain your energy. You have to maintain your focus in the camera. You you have to connect with your audience, which can't do if you're thinking ahead and the wheels are turning and now you're not looking or connecting. You can't listen to what the other person is actually saying and take notes and follow up if you're trying to figure out what your next question is. So thinking through the questions ahead of time guarantees that you are going to get better answers. And most people do not spend enough time thinking about the questions. I write down every single question that I ask an athlete. And people think that's overkill, but I have 90 seconds to make an impression during an interview. And that is all in. That's my questions. That's their answers. I better wow. get that right, right out of the gates, right? And yes, you're going to follow up if there's something that comes like completely out of the blue that you weren't expecting, but that should not be your plan going in. Your, your plan should not be, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take whatever they give me. Cause what happens if they're not having a very talkative day? Well, that's now what's what, going to happen to that conversation. Right, right. And I wanted to ask you about that because I think one of the things that's so interesting and relevant for salespeople is how you interview a lot of times these athletes and we see these interviews where like, yeah, no. And it's like, oh, that poor reporter, you know, and, and yet we have conversations with customers or prospects that are often very much like that. Like, um, yeah, that's not really a problem for me. No, 
you know, are very, very unresponsive. So how do you handle situations like that? The well, part of it is, do you know that person going in, right? So while yes, it is unfortunate when that happens on live TV, some of that is doing your homework ahead of time. If you know that you have a person who is introverted or plays things cl close to the vest, or for me, an athlete who doesn't like talking about themselves, which this happens all the time. And I know that conventional wisdom is, hey, just ask people about themselves because people love to talk about themselves. I can tell you that is the worst way to get an athlete to talk. And it's a terrible way to get a lot of people that are high up in companies who are making buying decisions to talk. Because why in the world would I let my guard down when you're trying to get me to part with money or time or resources, right? So right. we need to first understand that the types of questions that you ask can set up those responses and it's okay to get a one word response, but you better be prepared for another question right after it. So I will oftentimes just observe and comment on whatever that observation is. So for example, uh, if a player says, yeah, I actually didn't think that that was a very good play or they downplay it. Yeah, it's not a big deal. I hit home runs all the time, right? I would say, well, it doesn't look like you were as enthused as we were about watching you crush the ball to dead center field. How about how your teammates reacted to that, right? And so you shift the focus away from the individual to what the team is doing. And I have buckets of categories that I choose from for questions. So you kind of know, it's like following a sales script to some degree, because you know where you're going to pull your next little tidbit from. Um, right. It's not like you're going in this completely blind. If you're in that sales conversation and it happens, right, and back to your example and your point where that's not a problem for me, you can say, I am so glad to hear that because that has not been the response I've gotten from so many other people. I think I'm missing what your real problem is. And then you right. can dive into it that way, right? It, it is best if you think it's going to get awkward it's really best just to call it out in the most polite and conversational way possible because everybody knows what's happening, right? <laughs> it's not like you can just overlook and go, well, that's that a great happen. answer when it's clearly not a great <laughs> answer, right? But that's part of you feeling comfortable about A, the questions that you're asking, B, the script that you're following, knowing what you wanna get out of that conversation, right? Um, a phrase that I use quite often is it doesn't sound like you're too excited about that, right? So mm -hmm. if I ask somebody, and I could use that, um, if somebody said, oh yeah, I'm having a good day. And I'll say, really? Because it doesn't sound like that's overly convincing. <laughs> or that doesn't sound like you're too enthused about that. Right, And right. then I'll give them a chance to say, actually, it's a crummy day. Or no, 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 everything's fine, Jen. I'm just, I, I just came out of this meeting and, you know, the coach just this ripped happened, me and right. whatever, right? It happened. Yeah. So I'll use kind of one of those, um, it's a little playful. It's a little softer yeah. edge to be like, oh, oh, it sounds like I did not quite hit the mark on that one. Let's try this again. Right, right. But what's interesting is that isn't even a question. That's just a statement of what you observed. Yes. And I think, so, you know, having the confidence to throw that out there and then not just run off and say, I bet you're probably thinking about what, well, you know, and fill right. that space is, is powerful necessary. Yeah. And, you know, it takes, it, it takes a lot of time being on camera, having those conversations, right? It, it sure. takes, it takes for me, knowing that I'm prepared enough that I have the answers and that I can come up with a question for wherever that conversation goes. That's the expertise in an industry, whether you're in sales or broadcasting or acting, it is your expertise ultimately that's going to come through when you guide that conversation with confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's partly about getting confident in this medium. If you're not yeah. used to talking to someone through the camera, uh, that can make you feel less confident in your conversation and the questions you ask and your attitude. Um, what are some tips you might have for, you know, feeling confident on camera? Um, Cause right now, you know, you're making good eye contact with me. I think I'm making good eye contact with you, but neither of us are actually looking at each other. Is Correct. that true? Correct. Yes. Yes. I have only glanced at you once for maybe five seconds. Yep. 
Oh, I'm I can crushed. see that you're lovely. Like <laughs> I can, I can see the beautiful blue. Um, but yeah, if you want to make it look like you're making eye contact, you've got to look into the camera. And if it's uncomfortable, here's a little bit easier, in my opinion, it's okay, a little bit no, easier because the camera. The camera isn't as big. When you're looking into a TV camera, you've got this huge camera lens and mm -hmm. I've got a monitor that's right next to me and I can see everything. And sometimes looking into that camera, it really is like staring into a black abyss. Like th there is nothing, there is, I, I can't see anybody, right. right? And so sometimes looking at the very top. So if I, so right now I'm looking straight at the camera. If I shift my gaze just to the very top of it, Mm -hmm. You probably can't tell, but it's a little less vulnerable mm. than, than looking straight into the camera, right? So that's kind Fine. of one. Figure out where your eye level is going to be. It could be right at the top. It could be right in the middle. It could be right below, mm -hmm. but you do need to make eye contact into the camera because the minute that my focus drops here, even though mm -hmm. now I can see you, right? you're like, here we are, here we are looking at looking each other. At? Right. Like, yeah. what is she looking at? Right. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I would also say part of it goes back to just practicing how your voice is going to sound. And it's going to feel ridiculous the first few times that you do this. But when you go to rehearse, whatever it is that you're going to say, it could be the first 15 seconds. It could be your opening. It could be the voicemail that you plan to leave. It could be mm -hmm. any number of things. The five questions you're going to ask. When you go to practice it, you need to up your energy level to make up for both sides of that conversation because the camera takes away that energy. So when I work with interns, this is the hardest thing for them to get. It's not just about the words that you say, it's how you deliver it. Because as we already talked about, if I were to just come at you in my normal voice, this is how I would normally talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could be you very- You can lovely. tell. Right, hey, Jim. Right, it's very, and I'm, I'm pleasant and, you know, hey, Julie, and what's going on? And this is how we would talk if we were having coffee, but it's pretty easy to slip into a low energy mode, mm -hmm. at least how that's being perceived on the other side. So when I work with interns, the advice I give is, look, you need to amp that energy up to the point where you feel like you are being ridiculous and that you have overemphasized things. Right. But if you cannot feel the muscles in your face reacting to the emotion that you are trying to convey, you aren't giving me enough energy. Mm. If you can't feel your voice in the back of your throat, this does not mean that we're yelling. I'm not yelling. I am projecting, but I'm not right. yelling. Right. If you can't feel your voice back here, then you're probably coming across as very timid. Or what'll happen, especially when I work with real estate agents who are selling houses and the house is empty, they match the voice oh, to the environment. Right. And so suddenly you have this like, because we don't want to disturb anybody else in the house because there's nobody else in the house. So what? And it's ridiculous. <laughs> and it sounds creepy on a video. And you've got to get comfortable just recognizing that it does feel silly when you can't get an audience reaction, but it is hugely important for making sure that both sides stay engaged. That is such great advice. I love how you describe that because it, it absolutely is outside of your comfort zone for most people, right? They, they think, uh, you know, and I work with a lot of salespeople and they're like, well, I just want to be natural and comfortable. It's like, you know, we'd all like to be natural and comfortable and I don't want you to be unnatural. But we need to bring that more energized version of yourself, which I yes. know you can do. It's not being phony. It's you at your most engaged. Um, yep. But you have to find that level. And like you said, to translate across the camera. And it's not the stage, you know, the huge stage persona, but it is, it is a different than just, like you said, being, you know, sitting in a chair next to somebody very low key. Well, and it's camera presence. So yeah. I will talk about finding your voice, right? There's lots of different ways that we can find your voice. And it took me about 10 years to find my voice in broadcasting. Mm. Now, finding your voice means two things. Number one, I am comfortable with how I describe and characterize things. I am comfortable with how I talk about situations, players, coaching decisions, outcomes, that sort of thing. It takes time and expertise to know your community and to know your audience so that you know the words that will resonate. 
In sales, you already have those words. You've been practicing for that part of this conversation mm -hmm. for a long time. But the other part of finding your voice is in fact your camera presence. And it is understanding when to laugh and when not to. It is understanding how much energy it takes. Because look, if let's say this, let's say that we're having a conversation and you started off low energy and then your prospective client gives you some bad news and just says that they've laid, you know, half of the company off. Where are you going to go from there? How, how are you going to show empathy? And you, you were already here. I, I can't, I, I don't have anywhere to go, right? right? There's no range of emotions for me to tap into. And it doesn't make it phony. And I, I recognize that people have a, they're hung up on scripting and camera presence because they think it's inauthentic. Right. Right. It's about reaching your audience where they are. And your audience needs this from you. And I don't sound like this all the time, but when I get on my soapbox, you better believe my husband will tell you. It's like, yeah, you're, you're, you got your TV voice. <laughs> like, yeah, you're, take it down a notch, Jen. But it's not yeah. far off. No. This is not far off from how I actually talk. And if I'm on a phone call with somebody that I enjoy talking to, like this, right. This is kind yeah, of what you're it's, getting. It's, it's us that are most engaged, right? Yes. It's like, I just, I'm passionate about what I'm talking about and what I have to share. I'm fascinated in what your opinion is and I'm really engaged in this conversation. And that's gonna be much different than I'm just talking to somebody I talk to all the time. And uh, even though I may love that person dearly, it's just a different energy. Yeah. Uh, so this has been great. Any last thoughts on what you've learned as a broadcaster? And I know you speak to groups and companies about your experience and what really are some lessons that, that helped you in, in business and having effective conversations with people on video and in this virtual world? Yeah. You know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. And number one is when we are in a virtual space, we really don't want, we don't ever want to keep the audience guessing as to what happens next, but we really want to be clear on what our expectations are. And that could be the expectations for what we plan to get out of the conversation. It could be the timeline that you plan to follow up with them. It could be who's responsible for taking next steps in that follow-up process. We need to be very clear and verbalize things that we might might take for granted, mm -hmm. we can't assume that people can read our minds and just verbalizing things. There are times where, especially if we're presenting or if we are trying to keep the audience intrigued, we think that holding back some of the information will make them more likely to stick around and watch the video or to hang in there with us to the end of the conversation. We don't want surprise endings, right? That, that's not really what causes engagement. Mm. Tell people what it is that they are going to be getting. We do this in TV all the time. I was going to say, do something that's at TV the top 101, of the show. right? Yep. You tell people what they're going to get. You give it to them. You remind them what we just talked about. You tease what's coming up next. You right. can't assume that people love what you have to say as much as you do if you don't give them the good stuff. So when you are either presenting or having an interview and a conversation. Use verbal cues to keep people on the same page. Mm -hmm. Athletes will always know where I'm taking a conversation with them because nobody wants to look stupid on TV. <laughs> and you know, that questioning look and deer in the headlights right, look is not right. good for anybody, No, right? So I might say, you know, if I'm setting up an interview with an athlete, that play in the seventh inning, instead of tell me about what happened late in the game, right? that third down conversion that resulted in a touchdown, right? We're on the same page, there's no guesswork. When I'm getting close to the end of an interview, I will say two more questions for you, or lastly, before we wrap up, or could you give me one sentence on X, Y, and Z? So it's really clear where I want that conversation to go. I would do the same thing in a sales conversation. Oh, that's great. Right? Yeah, Here's the three things we're specific. gonna cover. Yep. Right. And be as specific as I possibly can. Right. Yep. So many salespeople, uh, and I certainly used to do this myself, you know, deliver a presentation and then, you know, periodically ask any questions, any questions, right? So what'd you think? You know, wide open questions that people get asked all the time. That's very easy to say, no, I'm good. You know, not yeah. going to stimulate a conversation, but that right. being specific. And I would say, 
you know, to your point about being prepared is don't expect to be brilliant in the moment, like write those out, right? I mean, we're just, I don't know about you, but if you're in the moment and you're really engaged, you don't have time to also write your copy, right? Right. <laughs> create your right. great concise to the point specific questions that are going to draw people out. That's exactly right. Excellent. Well, Jen, so great having you here. I'm going to leave people some uh, information on how to contact you. Great. Again, your, your business Talk Sporty to Me, which I just love that name, is uh, fascinating. I know keeping you very busy and you're doing a lot of virtual speaking at different events and companies. Yes, virtual speaking, virtual training. I've got some um, online training that's coming up soon that'll be exciting and yeah, we'll, we'll just keep making video work in the current time that we're in. And, and uh, I would suspect we keep using video for a long time to come. I, I think so. I think uh, those of us who have been holding back saying, I'm just going to, you know, give it a little cursory attention until it falls by the wayside might be in, in for a little something more permanent. All right. Well, Jen, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you soon. Great to have you. Sounds great. Thanks, Julie.